Well, let me just say, I have a rare privilege. Because often, you know, one of the, you don't often get to meet your real life, like heroes and stuff. But to say a few words to introduce and welcome everybody here, it is my immense privilege and pleasure to introduce the brother this just a hero to all of us, the uh, president of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and just a generally cool science kind of guy, Dr. Walter Massey. Well, I see why he's a success. <laughs> thank you, Aaron, and I want to thank all of you for being here this evening. Uh, it's really a distinct pleasure for me being both on the board of C2ST and also president of SAIC. Uh, the, the school, in fact, is very proud to be working with C2ST on a number of things. And as a scientist myself, uh, I really en am enjoying being at this institution where now I'm having the opportunity to think about and be engaged in conversations around the issue of art and science and how these two activities complement each other, maybe correlate with each other, and how artists and scientists see the world in different and in sometimes perhaps similar ways. We started at the school something we call Conversations on Art and Science about three years ago, where we bring in speakers and artists and scientists, engineers, uh, various fields to engage in this conversation about art and science. And we call it Conversations on Art and Science, Is There a There There? In other words, is there really something there that brings these fields together? And I think there is. So this year, for example, uh, we had SAIC graduate students who are working on joint projects, our artists and designers, are working on joint projects with science graduate students at the University of Chicago, and about seven joint projects involving 15 different students. And that's under the auspices of the University of Chicago's Arts, Science, and Culture Initiative. We have another course we started uh, called Data Viz, V-I-Z, was our uh, in collaboration with the McCormick School of Engineering at Northwestern. And we bring together art and design students from SCIC and engineering, computer science students from uh, Northwestern to look at ways in which visualizations can be exemplified through using big data, bringing together the, the ways artists and scientists, or engineers in this case, see data. And the idea is that they look for ways to bring out what might be hidden information in these massive amounts of data, but the project also has a result not in something that's informed analytically uh, the information about the information in the data, but all has to, also has to be aesthetically pleasing. And we'll, I hope you look on our website and check those. We have an exhibition at the end of each year uh, when the students present their works. We also started a scientist in residence program uh, two years ago. So far, we've had uh, an expert on artificial intelligence, a neuroscientist, and this year, a mathematician. And they work with our students, teach a course, and um, advise students on projects, bringing together art and science. So those are just a few of the examples that we are doing. But as you know, there are many examples of artists and scientists working together across the spectrum in many ways around the country. And C2ST has been instrumental and bringing many of those kinds of activities here. So I want to thank all of my fellow board members, our leader, Alan Shreesheim, uh, for making this happen. And now I'll turn the podium back over to Aaron Freeman, who's going to moderate a very interesting panel this evening. Aaron. All right, uh, now, so for those of you who are not familiar, C2SD, the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, we who had, had the gang, just C2SD, it's all good, just hanging out at C2SD. But it is, uh, Chicago Council, it's a not-for-profit organization that brings together um, 
Chicago scientific leaders from academic institutions, corporations, museums, national laboratories, and to provide a forum for discussion of current of issues of current interest in the scientific community, uh, and also to bring scientists together with us civilians, so that this, we can see that they're not nearly as scary as you might think from watching Big Bang Theory. Now, uh, we have, a, just so you know, we have a number of really interesting health-related programs coming up next month. Uh, we have a, on April 1st is a really interesting program on traumatic head injury and playing sports. Uh, we have uh, personalized medicine delivery coming up, drug-resistant pathologies. And if you are free on June 4th, let me just tell you, do not, you do not want to miss uh, Science in the Second City, uh, our annual big, wonderful, fabulous fundraising gala, uh, June 4th, that would be the 4th of June, right before the 5th, right after the 3rd, 4th of June at the Adler Planetarium. Um, and also I want to say I want to thank uh, with Dr. Massey and the School of the Art Institute for donating, donating this wonderful, wonderful space. Uh, so now uh, we are going to zip along with the program. The first speaker, uh, the first member of our panel is what they call a poisonal friend of mine. Uh, Torn Hopkins is a recent graduate cum laude in physiology, chemistry, and music from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Uh, Torin is now working as an adjunct uh, fMRI data analyst and research assistant, primarily studying how memories are consolidated bilaterally in the human cortex. And we just love those bilateral cortexual studies. Uh, he also designs, builds, codes, and analyzes um, musical technologies in order to enhance the accessibility of music playing, theory, and education. Please welcome Torin Hopkins. Thank you so much, Aaron. I really appreciate it. Thank you, C2ST, for putting this wonderful event together. And a special thanks to Christopher Epig and Andrea Poet for getting me on this stage. And to the Art Institute and this SAIC for hosting this event here. I'm really extremely appreciative of being here. This is a tremendous opportunity. So, hello. My name is Torn Hopkins. I'm 23 years old and graduated college in 2013, having studied human physiology, chemistry, and music. In the year following my graduation, I began work as an adjunct neuroscience research associate doing data analysis on what are called statistical parametric mapping computer programs. I complemented this work with projects using my codable Arduino microcircuit board and eventually got in touch with Idan Beck, CEO of Companies Incident and now OFO, to begin designing an application for the smartphone-driven products he was creating within his company. Though personal computers have always been in my life, before just a few years ago, I didn't consider myself technologically proficient. As a matter of fact, I rejected certain aspects of technology for the longest time. I held this belief that somehow businesses were using this new technology to take over all the good young minds and suck them into this little device we called a smartphone. I slowly watched all my peers convert, walking with their heads down and eyes fixated on their screens, clicking away like little robots out of some terribly twisted sci-fi movie. This scared me so much that I stuck with my flip phone, snubbed any electronic sounding music, and solely embraced everything natural and analog to the best of my ability. At some point, I even began to call myself technologically deficient because the avoidance of this technology meant I could not perform basic functions on my friends' devices when I was asked to do something for them. So it didn't take long until I realized something very important about technology, or more accurately, myself. Maybe it was some economic ploy to get people hooked and plugged into smartphones. Maybe it wasn't. What did it matter? I realized I was limiting my potential and even further convinced myself I could not use technology and therefore should not. This label I assigned myself, this technological deficiency, damaged my self-confidence and ultimately pulled me away from a beautiful part of the human experience. This realization led me to seeking out hands-on opportunity with computers, microcircuits, and smartphones. 
Soon after taking the large step of purchasing an iPhone, I bought what is called an Arduino. It's basically a little codable micro circuit board that came with instructions to a website where there are loads of forums and friendly people to help you along creating whatever it is you desire. The coding language was really simple and the program was free. This little boost of confidence inspired me to move on to applications for the iPhone using a free program called Xcode, available at the Apple App Store. So affordable programs and user-friendly coding platforms of Xcode made this an extremely smooth transition. After gaining some degree of fluency, I used much of my newfound skill with application to music technology and music education. While investigating different methodologies for teaching music, I began to notice just how frustrating it is to learn to play an instrument. My friends at Incident Technologies also noticed some of these frustrations and took a survey of over a thousand people nationwide in an attempt to find out what people thought it took to learn an instrument and how technology was perceived in the education process. Here are a few of the stats. They found that one in six musicians indicated that they have never, would have never learned an instrument without technology. 70% think it takes six or more months to learn how to play an instrument, which is quite a time investment. And 85% of non-musicians wished they could play an instrument, which I find pretty remarkable. So what is to be done about this conundrum? How can we begin accomplishing things we never thought possible but have always wanted to do? Well, I think it takes, at the very least, two major things. Well, first things first, we need to believe, and I mean really believe we can do them. You are equipped with all the tools you need right now. All of you in this room are the owners of the Earth's most powerful computers, your brain kept right between your ears. And the second is a technology that can match your desire with a fluency that can allow you to excel. In my case, Apple's free and easy to use tutorial walkthroughs, free coding software like Xcode, and a large amount of online forums helped me get where I wanted to be. But also take someone like Beethoven, for example. It can be argued that the elegant use of dynamics in his compositions differentiated him significantly from the composers of his era. This inspiration was in large part made possible because of the extreme development of the piano during that same time period, and serendipitously allowed for this new dynamic sound. The marriage of the internal drive to express and the fluency of a system that allows one to do so is fully captured by the essence of the smart instrument. I think it is about time to introduce the newest form of uh, music technology out there today, something we like to call smart instruments. These instruments take the power of your smartphone and allow you to use them in your instruments. Yes, inside your instruments, as you can see right here. Connecting the wonder of the internet, as well as the power of social media connection, and the flexibility of independent applications in an instrument you can control. So this is the guitar. I'm pretty sure I got it working here so that I can show you a little bit. So here, it has 96 RGB LEDs, which operate on a full color spectrum. And you can go through and do plenty of different loops and other fun things, as well as clear that and operate like that. You can do all this fun stuff. This is just fun, right? What's really cool, though, is I can go back and show you a few things about songs and how to do that, which I'll show you in a minute. So this is the world's very first smart instrument. This technology has the ability to match your desire to learn, in this case, guitar, with an unmatched fluency of any other instrument right out of the box. So as you can see, this instrument has full color spectrum LEDs in each fret and allows the interaction between the smartphone and your guitar. This allows the user to interact with the instrument in a way that has never before been possible. Equipped with a large circuit board and a docked smartphone, the guitar produces sound by reading where you have played a note on the fretboard and relays the information down to your phone, where it either projects to the phone speakers, out to an amplifier, or via USB which you can plug straight into your computer. So at this time, there are three main uses 
in terms of apps for the GTAR. First is the GTAR app, and this is a free app that you get on the App Store, which allows you to learn at your own pace any of the songs available in the library, which is constantly being updated. So there are lots of free songs and some that require purchasing, but none are over a dollar. You can learn these songs at three difficulty levels. One is easy, the other is medium and hard. In the easy mode, there is no need to hold down your fingers. You just need to strum the correct strings. All non-desired notes are muted out to encourage the player to learn at their own pace. And the levels get successively harder, making finger placement and accuracy necessary to produce the correct notes. So your performance is then scored, and then you can share your scores with social feed to all your friends. So the second is the Learn app. And this is also a free app. And this app literally starts from step one, teaching you everything from how to hold a pick and guitar to where the notes are on that guitar. This app operates on a step-by-step -step basis, and you unlock levels as you improve until you know your way around a guitar and can start playing and building your own arsenal of tunes. So the third is you can just plug your smartphone in and run any application that uses Core MIDI. So this is my personal favorite way to mess around with this instrument. You just get the lights going and run a cool synthesizer app. Something like Argon is only $1.99 in the App Store. This method opens up a world of inspiration for someone who wants to play digitally. All right. I'm just going to quickly show you, since I wasn't able to earlier. What I meant by being able to just plug in and play a song. Oh, yeah. Now this product debuted on Kickstarter just a little over two years ago, so major improvements are still to come on all levels of this new technology. Devices such as Keys, a smartphone dockable piano keyboard, have just recently hit crowdfunding sites like Indiegogo and are slated for production later this summer. This is a very exciting time for music. In an age where computer networks have never been more pervasive, knowledge and inspiration are surfacing everywhere. Musicians and engineers are working on the same projects every day, and we are all becoming more and more connected. Now before I finish, I'd like to remind you of the two major elements I mentioned earlier that are required to accomplish your goals for learning new skills. One is an internal desire to learn, and two, are technologies that match your drive with a fluency that allows you to excel. Now, the first is something we all have the capability to possess as individuals, but the second takes the cooperation of scientists to produce the technology that matches the fluency of an artist's touch. And in this light, we accomplish a common goal, one that will remain connected as long as we exist and will continue to reshape our world. I'm Torin Hopkins. This is the GTAR. Thank you very much.
I want a guitar. It looks like kind of an electronic lava lamp a little bit there, you know? Of course, only old, no, I guess only, well, it's not, lava lamps are still around, aren't they? They still exist, yeah, yeah, because it's one of those things you think like, oh, it's only what you did in college when you got really stoned and watched your lava lamp. But now you can get really stoned and play your guitar. I like it, I like it, I like it. Well, see, the only problem with this kind of, with the guitar is that it, you can't really dance while you're playing it. You know, because for me, the most useful part biologically uh, uh, of music is dancing. Because at the point, uh, dancing is where music does the th one thing that we want all science and technology do to do, which is help us get laid. <laughs> I mean, let's be serious about it. You know, this is the whole deal, you know. So a, music is a, no, dancing is a vertical intention, extension of a horizontal intention, you know. Well, I live in Highland Park, and I, I became a Jew, they told me I had to. So um, in Highland Park, that, that's the big joke, is why don't Orthodox Jews have sex standing up? Because it might lead to dancing. <laughs> that's what they say in Highland Park. But now, moving right along. <laughs> Nicholas Collins was born and raised where I went to college, in New York. Uh, he has been a composer and a, ooh, didn't mean to do that. He's been a composer and a performer of electronic and, in, and instrumental music for more than 40 years. He has presented over a thousand concerts and installations worldwide. He spent the 80s uh, performing, in, recording, and touring the US, Europe, and Japan as a solo artist, as well as co in collaboration with various groups. He returned to the U.S. in 1999 to join the Department of Sound at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, Collins is editor-in-chief of the Leonardo Music Journal. His book, Handmade Electronic Music, The Art of Hardware Hacking, has influenced emerging electronic music worldwide. His indecisive career trajectory is reflected in his, in his having played both CBGB and Concert Chabrao. I love Concert Chabrao, only because I can say it. Concert Chabrao. <laughs> so please uh, welcome, give a warm welcome to Nicholas Collins. Okay. Can we switch me over here? Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, I actually work right upstairs here. I uh, teach in the Department of Sound here at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. This is an unusual school in that um, very early on in the 1970s, they decided that sound was as legitimate an art material as the ones we usually think of. And therefore, um, it's had a very experimental and progressive approach to uh, working with sound that occupies a place quite different from most traditional music. Now, if you read uh, even ordinary papers, you find that sound art is a term that's becoming much more prevalent. It's becoming a much bigger business. But uh, at the time that the program started here, it was definitely out on the fringe. What I'd like to uh, do today is uh, talk about the, the two parts of this in sort of two separate sections. I'm going to start by talking about technology, which very often is confused uh, with science, and it's not the same, uh, but it's obviously informed by science, and uh, there's a lot of science that goes into making the technology that we depend on in our life. Um, I started out doing music <clears throat> when I was a teenager, and I, I was involved with electronic sound almost from the beginning. But this was at a time that's difficult for, I think, for many of you to consider, which is before computers and before smartphones and before guitars. And um, I'd say that the biggest difference technologically wasn't so much in what you could do with the technology as in the cost of it. You have no idea, you young people, how much power you get for so little money at the moment with things like phones and computers. It's, it's, it's really... Uh, 
mind-boggling. Things were more primitive and more expensive when I was younger, and in the age before portable personal computers, uh, the only electronic music one could make as a performer depended on, in this country, making your own instruments. We had no institutions that supported electronic music here the way it happened in other countries, for example, in Europe. And unless you were a rock star, you couldn't afford a synthesizer like a Moog, so you made things. And you made them not very well, generally speaking, because you were a musician, not an engineer. Um, so that's how I started. And then throughout the 80s, the computer rose up and supplanted all these simple little homemade circuits with, as I say, these remarkably powerful configurable devices. But then we get to um, 1999. I'd been living in Europe for many years. I ran out of money. I had two hungry children. And I uh, took a job here at the Art Institute, which I hope has been of mutual benefit. My children have grown and not starved to death, and I'm still here. So um, 1999, the computer was everywhere. It was in every department of this school. It was on every concert stage. And yet, uh, when I arrived, it was like the morning after a party, and everyone was a little hungover. There was like a kind of a digital hangover, um, overindulgence. And what my students presented me with was the following conundrum, which is visual artists, no matter how sophisticated they are working with video and holography and rapid prototyping and everything else like that, they all started out messy. They all started out scribbling. They all started out doing things with their hands. And that is a really key driving instinct in most people who call themselves artists is the touch of the hand. And for all the power you get in your computers, uh, the hand is not very well connected to the computer. The computer is a much less playable instrument than a snare drum or a banjo or a violin or a piano. And I'll take that argument up with anyone because I've been trying to play them for 30 years, okay? And I know what I'm talking about. So my students were caught in this quandary, which is they were raised on electronic sound. That was their world. They wouldn't know a violin if one bumped into them in the street, okay? But they wanted to touch sound. They wanted to touch it and work with it the way they drew, the way they used a paintbrush, or the way they played a guitar, or they played a drum, all right? So they found out that I was from another time when that was a more prevalent way of working. Little circuits, little things that you actually manipulated directly with your fingers. And they basically cajoled me into putting together a course. And that kind of snowballed. It was like a virus that got out of control. And it led to a book. And the book led to a lot of workshops. So what I want to do now is I want to show you a short videotape. Hopefully our sound is running. A short videotape that, that walks you through what happens in these workshops. And what I do is I go and I work with groups of people who may have no experience whatsoever with any technology, and we start with very simple experiments, and we work our way up to the point that they're actually designing circuits from scratch the way one might in engineering school. And I stress three things in the workshops, all right? One is making performable instruments that work with electronic sound, that bring back to our electronically mediated world, that sense of immediacy that you have with traditional instruments, okay? The second is using that technology to make new ways of hearing things. We make a lot of very inexpensive and very unusual microphones because all of you are listening to music through earbuds these days. All of your music is electronically mediated. If you can affect the way that that music enters into the recording process, you, that is like the first step towards transforming and personalizing sound to make it your own. And the last thing is more of a sort of a philosophical or moral issue, which is we depend more and more and more on technology that we have less and less direct understanding of. My father was of the generation of guys, even though he was a academic, who knew how to put up the hood of the car and fix something under it. He knew how to change a tire. He knew how to build a bookshelf. He knew how to change a tap washer. 
These are skills which, by the way, are almost gone today, all right? None of us knows what's going on inside these machines. And there's a very strange sense of alienation. So part of this process, in addition to ending up with these weird, wonderful, playable instruments and unusual microphones, is to show people you can do it. People invented these things. People attempted to perfect these things. You can open this thing up and you can destroy it. Okay? So this is what it looks like and sounds like. I got it. It's okay. So we start by just taking speakers and batteries and bits of metal, no electronics whatsoever, and we make very primitive oscillators, what a friend of mine calls the Victorian synthesizer. Everything's out in the open. The speaker becomes a musical instrument. And you activate it just by giving it a jolt from a battery. And it becomes a visual instrument. Contact microphones, they're like an electronic stethoscope. Here they're creating music with feedback. And then uh, we open up electronic circuits and put our fingers on the circuit board. This is running on batteries, you don't have to worry. And the current flows through your skin. You don't feel a thing, but you're actually able to merge your body with the electronic circuit to play it with direct skin contact. electronic toys and make substitutions of components to make very simple children's toys much more playable in the style of instruments. Here we start building our own oscillators which can be controlled by light or skin contact or pressure and here you see a number of variations. a handful of components on that little plastic block. We work a lot with light. It's a very responsive medium for control. to say. Okay, so, um, no, 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 it's premature. Um, so, I mean, I, I will admit, I will admit, I, I live on the lunatic fringe, and I, I embrace this sound world as, as I would my family, and I understand that this is not everyone's cup of tea, all right? It's noisy stuff. Um, I'm not asking you to take it home, but 
one thing you will notice is that everything there was produced with very, very direct interaction of the hand and the object. Yeah? There were no mice, there were no trackpads, yeah? there were no ASCII keyboards. And I don't know, maybe a lot of you do this when you get home, and so this is no big deal. For most of the people who do these workshops, this is just an amazingly weird idea, right? That you can, you can perform and play with technology in such an intimate way, okay? So, as I said, the other thing about the little experiments that we can do in these projects um, is to make unusual microphones, and the microphones change the way you hear the world, just the way those of you who are interested in photography, you know that when you look at the world through a camera, it very often changes the way you see it. You frame it with more accuracy and better understanding or something. So there's a kind of a microphone called a contact microphone. As I said, it's like an electronic stethoscope. It's a little disc. It's the disc that's in every device in your life that goes beep. And we take it and we turn it around. And instead of using it as a speaker, we use it as an input. It's very sensitive, and it lets you pick up mechanical vibrations. So instead of the sound of the air vibration from my talking, it picks up the sound that's, say, scratching on a tabletop or something like that. These things are everywhere at the Art Institute. You cannot get a Bachelor of Fine Arts at SAIC without building a couple of these. And um, I'm forever searching for new things to demonstrate with it to show people, listen, it's worth spending five minutes soldering this thing up because you'll just discover this whole world. So uh, doing a class once under a sprinkler head, I decided to set off fireworks to see what they sounded like. And I discovered it was quite a wonderful, wonderful noise. And so I had a commission to do a piece for a, a gallery in New York, and I did a three-screen video projection of three sparklers. You know the things you terrify small children with on the Fourth of July? Each one is just being videotaped, and the only sound you hear is a contact mic on the stem, the wire stem. And this was done as a loop. It's about a little under two minutes long. And you're going to see two of these sparklers burning down, and the sound you're going to hear is the sound of a contact mic on the, on the stem of the sparkler. And don't clap too early because there is a denouement in this. So here's the description, which I just told you. I should have had this up. Bad PowerPoint on my part. And here we go. So, no, 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 not yet, not yet. So here we're gonna we're gonna transition from technology into science, okay? Which is that uh, the technology was very visible in that 
little clip of the hacking workshops, you saw all of the stuff in front of you and you, and you, and you really felt you were hearing technology. But here, the technology is unbelievably crude that's used in this, right? I mean, Marco Polo found the Chinese playing with those sparklers in the 15th century and the contact mic works with a principle called piezoelectricity, which was discovered in the 18th century. Um, this is very, very basic stuff. But the science is what's interesting, right? What happens when, when one of these sparklers burns is it's, I think it's magnesium on it, burns at a very, 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 very high temperature. And uh, you have this little metal rod, a little metal wire that is a couple of thousand degrees at one end and room temperature at the other. And something's got to give. And that's what you hear. What you hear is the differential cooling of that metal bar as the burning stops and it tries to bring itself back down to room temperature. And that snap and pop is just like playing the bar of a marimba or a xylophone, but it's being done by the, as I say, the differential cooling of the bar. It's as if you had a Fender Rhodes piano that was played with fire, right? Because it's just like the tines in a Fender Rhodes, for those of you who are aficionados of that instrument, okay? So here we used a very simple technological device to get this microscopic view of this gorgeous sound phenomenon that nobody ever hears, even though kids all over the country are waving these things at their brothers, right? So that's where we get into science. Now, admittedly, as I say, what I was showing you is some pretty noisy stuff. And I realize that isn't everybody's uh, favorite thing to listen to. So I'm going to make the science move a little bit more complete now and talk a little bit about acoustics, which is the other thing that interests me a lot. I think, I think it interests most musicians and composers one way or the other. But um, I'm particularly interested in it, in it because um, I, I come from a background with very little musical practice. Both my parents were architectural historians, and, and my childhood was spent in concert halls but looking at the building rather than listening to the music. And then when I went to university, I studied with a composer who was famous for doing some very early, very radical pieces that dealt with architectural acoustics as musical material. And this, this became a very important thing for me, and it's something I've worked with for many, many years. So I, um, I'm very interested in, in performance and playing. I'm not interested particularly in making records or working with technology that plays everything back for you. I, I enjoy tremendously working with extremely talented musicians in many places. Musicians are usually much better at making musical decisions than I am at making them, right? I'm the kind of composer who likes to grant a musician a fair amount of freedom. So I figured out a way to use my computer to make an acoustic analysis of any space we're in. It's not a difficult thing to do. You know, when you're in the shower and you go, oh, and there's one note that's louder than all the others, right? Well, I'm using a program I wrote here on the computer to do an analysis of this room. We're going to run it right now. We're going to do this piece in front of you. And what it's going to do is it's going to analyze what are the strongest resonant frequencies of the room. That is, what are those fundamental notes? What is the low E string of this room, OK? And a room's a very weird-shaped thing, so it isn't as regular as you get in most musical instruments. It does the analysis, and it's going to put the pitches up here. And the strongest one is going to be on the left, and the weakest one is going to be on the right, and they're going to come in one at a time. You're going to hear it, you're going to see it. And we're going to get like a sort of a melody or a tone row that is this room's song, for want of a better term. Every room has a song. We're going to hear this room's song. And at that point, what would normally happen is all the electronics would stop, and musicians would be playing regular instruments, reading this score, and following a particular set of instructions I give them to play variations on this, as if it's like a jazz chart, 
all right? Those of you who are familiar with working from charts. You see some notes, you play on it as a chord, you go on, all right? So here we go. We're going to start with the analysis, and then I'm going to have a very dumb musician who I programmed play piano variations on that thing so that if you don't read music, you don't have to worry about it, okay? So here we go. It's finished. We have 24 notes, the 24 strongest frequencies. Why 24? I wanted it to be twice as good as 12-tone music. Okay? <laughs> and then electronics are gone. I highlight a note and I say, all right, start playing just that note. This is the root note of this hall. We may have 16 musicians, we may have four, we may have 50. And you're just getting all these people playing this one note. As my father always used to kid me about my music, one note blues. And then, ah, little variation. We now can pick, make patterns out of those two. So it's a slow piece. Add another. guys are getting the top 40 version of this. And then after we've sort of set this, this chord in place, people get a sense of it, we change a color, and this tells the musicians now they can not only play these notes, but any octave of the note as a way to just fatten up the texture a bit, but without violating the fundamental acoustical rules that they're following. So you get a bit thicker a texture, right? And you sit on this for a minute or so. And then when I think it's enough, then you get a chord change. We've moved to a new chord. We've gone from one to five or wherever. They've got this set of four chord pitches related octaves, and they just noodle around and try to make it as interesting as possible. And after a minute or so, you get a sense of what the tonality is at this point in the row, and then you go. any other chord change, only I didn't write it. Architect wrote it.
Okay, so now you can clap. Now you can clap. So I apologize for the insipid piano playing, but I couldn't bring the band on stage with me. Um, the thing about music with a minimal amount of information is it makes maximal use of the human brain to turn it into something interesting. And as has been mentioned, the human brain is much more powerful than this, okay? But you can get some sense of how, as we move from, from the strongest tones of the room to the ones that are furthest away, there is some weird sense of movement. I mean, it's not like any ordinary song you probably have heard on the radio, but there, there are these mystical little changes that take place. And those of you who know the music, say, of Eric Satie or Morton Feldman, there's a certain similarity in the sort of ambiguous tonality that comes out. So in any case, um, that's my take on using the science of acoustics to produce something that is, well, by my consideration, is in the domain of art, okay? And I think that's all I have to tell you. Thank you. One more time for Nicholas Collins. That was really... <laughs> Fabulous and interesting. And, st and I would say that that is an ex a great example of the kind of programming that you would only get here at C2SC. Something really interesting and something strange and that you would never see. And you also get a sense of the passion and delight that the, pe that the, the working scientists uh, have for their work. And so it was really tons of fun. And by the way, uh, there will be, uh, at the end of our final presentation, an opportunity for questions and answers so you can be thinking and noodling around in your little cerebral cortices what you might want to know and ask. But our final speaker this evening uh, is Doug McBride, who is a music producer, mixer, mastering engineer, multi-instrumentalist, and owner of Gravity Studios in Chicago. He began his career as an artist who garnered interest from Atlantic Records, then cut his teeth in production work at the Chicago Recording Company. I've done much work down at CRC myself. Uh, in the early 1990s at CRC, uh, Doug worked on many projects, including Cheap Tricks, uh, Budokan 2, Izzy Stratlin's first solo album, and Dog Eye View. He then founded Gravity Studios, uh, and the first band he worked with was uh, Veruca Salt, producing their hit Seether. He's continued to work with numerous local bands, uh, including uh, the the, uh, the uh, Wooly uh, label, whose producer, uh, whose owner, I think, is here. The label is here, right here. There he is. Uh, so thank you for coming. <laughs> Don't mean to embarrass you. It's all right. We're not going to make you stand up or anything. It's all right, you know. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Doug McBride speaks at conferences and colleges around the country, teaches recording classes at Tribeca Flashport Media Arts Academy. Please welcome Doug McBride. Testing, testing. All right. What a f interesting bunch of stuff we've had already. I uh, what you were, I was think I couldn't stop thinking about John Cage is another name of someone uh, who uh, that reminded me of uh, lunatic and lunatic fringe. Uh, that that's a great way to describe. Uh, I have always uh, looked at art, um, especially producing and, and mixing, um, uh, on a kind of a continuum between the, the Dionysian and the Apollonian. Uh, so Nietzsche wrote about that, and I picked that up, and, uh, you know, the idea being that uh, uh, the Dionysian uh, art that reflects that is kind of madness, sexuality, violence, uh, that sort of uh, primitive side, and then the Apollonian side being uh, structure and um, 
the framing, uh, uh, maybe more conventional kinds of uh, art. Um, and uh, so I, at a young age, I really coming out of college, uh, I started to think about uh, my work along those lines and realized pretty quickly that I, I, uh, uh, that I wanted to be somewhere in the middle, um, largely because when you're working in music, um, you know, music become, there, there's a pretty intimate connection between the, the writer, the producer, and the, the music. So if you spend a lot of time in the Dionysian, it can, uh, it can be disruptive to your life, let's put it that way. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you uh, spend too much time on the other side, you, uh, you may get bored to death. <laughs> That's the way I looked at it. So uh, uh, I have found, interestingly, I've found in my 25 years doing this that um, as music has changed and, and as the, the clients I've worked with have, have kind of morphed from one genre to another, I've seen myself being asked to pull, uh, to pull projects or pull songs um, more into one direction uh, or another. Um, and uh, sometimes I articulate that to the artist. Uh, sometimes we have a, a, a conversation about that, but more often it's just, you know, I, I see this, you know, this album is uh, just a little too, uh, this group of songs is a little too uh, Apollonian for me, so I wanna see if I can bring some, uh, um, uh, some techno uh, technology that would be uh, you know, kind of unpredicted uh, into, to bear in order to pull it to the other side, if you will. Um, let's see. Um, yes, my name's Doug McBride. I, um, this is all I've ever done. I, um, I got out of college in 1990 and uh, got a job at CRC and worked there uh, for, for three years. Uh, 100 hours a week though, so I, it felt like, I think it, I, get, I should get credit for six years. Um, and, uh, and I've never worked a day in, with a suit on. I'm proud of that. Um, and, uh, the thing I love most about technology is uh, I like finding creative solutions to tricky problems um, in the studio. Um, uh, that's where uh, I appreciate technology most. Um, um, but now, it's really hard, as I was telling someone recently, it's really hard to, um, to create uh, a modern production without using um, relatively sophisticated technology. The computer program that, that I use for a lot of uh, my work is called Pro Tools, and it's the kind of industry standard software. And it's, uh, it's kind of a rabbit hole. You can go down as deep into it as you care to. But someone told me it was the, uh, the, the Pro Tools, uh, the software was originally designed, I think, in like 1990 or 91 or something. And uh, someone told me that it was the most uh, complicated, essentially, um, densest, uh, most involved uh, software that was commercially available or that was used commercially. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the irony, and I think you touched on it, was, is that um, the technology cuts both ways. Um, sometimes it's uh, undeniably helpful and, and helps us without question. And then there's some times where it sets us back a touch for one reason or another. And with regard to the, the DAWs, is what we call the Pro Tools and similar uh, recording uh, medium, uh, digital audio workstations, they, uh, everyone gets one, it's called GarageBand. If you've, uh, uh, some people have seen them when you open up a Mac, if you ever had a, a Mac laptop, you got a free copy of GarageBand. And it's a, a, a nifty and well thought out uh, software. 
Um, and it's a, you know, it's a very simple version of Pro Tools, essentially. And it's, uh, uh, it's terrific that uh, anyone can have that experience of recording and capturing their ideas um, and making, learning to make music. And so we've consequently got a lot more content. There's a, thousands and thousands of records made every year. Um, as opposed to really probably a thousand made, you know, in uh, the seventies, for instance. Um, and so with that, um, there's a lot more um, kind of uh, semi-professional or um, homegrown recordings and produ productions. Um, and some of the way that that uh, uh, works its way uh, into the culture and into the industry at large, um, I'll get to a, a little later, but it's, uh, like I said, there's, uh, there's pros and cons. I mean, if I were to touch on it briefly, I would say, uh, there, the best analogy is, uh, for anyone who's a photographer or who wor has worked with, uh, analog cameras, um, if your dad had a Nikon or a, you know, Pentax or whatever, they're, um, when you when you see uh, photographs that were well well taken uh, that are 15 20 years old um, there's a uh, there's a certain um, smoothness a certain um, uh, there's something about them that's uh, more engaging um, more involved I guess than what you get with a high with a high powered DSL or, or DSL camera or whatever. Um, the there's, it's a, there's a similar situation with analog and digital technology and audio, um, where at best digital audio can be transparent um, from a sonic point standpoint. Um, the best it can be possibly is transparent. Uh, it's not going to necessarily, it doesn't in and of itself uh, provide any, um, any improved quality uh, unless you're talking about sample rates and stuff like that, which is another thing. Um, with the older technology, um, uh, it was sort of the opposite where um, there were transformers and tubes and uh, uh, oxide on, on, on analog tape. And each of these things added essentially second and third harmonic distortion, which, um, as you can tell by the name distortion, it's uh, something that uh, the, guy, the guys at that time thought was a bad thing, but it was pretty much unavoidable. So consequently, when, when people say, you know, I love the sound of old recordings, uh, um, what they're saying is I, uh, they, they love the sound of second and third harmonic distortion, which, uh, and there's nothing, uh, and crossover distortion. And I'm, I'm one of them. I think that, there, I think that some of my favorite records, uh, I can, uh, I've done research on them, and sometimes I don't need to do research. I can tell that they've been, uh, that the instruments have gone uh, through a lot of, uh, a long signal path, I guess you could say. I guess uh, I better get back on uh, back on my original track here. Um, so uh, my father taught me guitar in the seventh grade, and uh, um, I played in bands starting in seventh and eighth grade, and played in bands for years and years. Um, on my fifteenth birthday, I got a. a, a four-track cassette recorder called the Fostex uh, X15. And um, do we have, have that up there? Yeah. And uh, it was a big deal at the time um, because uh, you could record three tracks and then transfer them onto the fourth track. Uh, and then you'd have then uh, record over the original three tracks. So you'd have six uh, performances um, that you could mix together to uh, flesh out a song idea. And I went crazy with that thing, as well as the two or three machines after that. 
uh, writing and, and uh, recording, and uh, most of the time playing the playing all the instruments. Um, I would uh, one, one thing I learned in the process was that uh, a lot of the, what I wanted to hear on drums, bass, piano, organ, guitar, a lot of what I actually wanted to hear wasn't really that hard to play. <laughs> you know, pretty, pretty simple parts uh, in, in the kind of music that I was writing. Um, so that was encouraging. As well, I had a, uh, a really close friend in high school and through college, and still a friend, but um, his name is Scott Bennett, or is Scott Bennett. He lives in LA uh, now. He's been working with uh, with Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys as kind of his right hand man now for 16 years, I think. And uh, but before that, we'd played together and, and wrote wrote songs together. And he was a little bit older and kind of uh, was a buddy as well as a mentor. I would say I appreciate the mentor part as I grow older and look back on it. But um, but Scott signed to a, a big uh, record deal with a major label and uh, then was kind of unceremoniously dropped. And uh, watching that process uh, helped me to, re it was informative and helpful for me because I realized that uh, while I had interest in, in being an artist, um, uh, I, I realized that there wasn't necessarily a correlation between uh, talent, hard work, and success. Um, there, there were way too many things in between that I had no control over. Um, like your, your attorney having dinner at Spago with the label's attorney and stuff like that. Uh, things that uh, shouldn't play a big role, you know, did. So, uh, I realized that uh, every bit as much as I liked uh, performing, I liked uh, the process of recording. I'd, I'd uh, uh, in college, uh, and when on a Friday night when my friends were all going out to parties, I'd stay at home and work, write a song and, and per lay down the tracks and build it up. And I've got uh, so many memories, uh, maybe 10 or 15 times when uh, I would come out of my dorm room or apartment, as it were, um, and uh, wake up one of my roommates and say, oh, you got to hear this. I just finished it. And he'd, he'd be like, what are you doing? It's 3, 4, it's 4 a.m., you know. You? And uh, I'd lose track of time. I would, I would have thought, I thought, oh, it must be about 11, you know, but it was 4 a.m. So uh, I figured that's a good sign if, I, uh, if I'm getting lost in it, I'm, it must be something that I'm supposed to do. Um, so, uh, when I got out of college, I started, uh, yeah, started working at CRC, and, um, oh, yeah, the, let's see, my friend Scott, I think there was a picture there of him with some of his acquaintances, and then, um, yeah, at CRC, um, it was pretty hardcore. Um, at that time, uh, CRC was the pretty much uh, the far and away the best uh, uh, music-related studio in the city or, and in the Midwest. And the, the engineers and producers that came to work there were the best in the country. And so I got to um, assist and, and um, tape op uh, for quite a few talented people and, and work on these records um, with Izzy Stradlin and Cheap Trick. And the, these were projects where we would spend three months, you know, recording or um, six months. And so it was uh, the attention to detail was pretty significant. And um, And there was a pretty large amount of technology uh, to be learned in order to pull that off. Uh, there were uh, uh, one of my friends, Chris Shepard, who's still, a, he's the manager at CRC now. Uh, we kind of cut our teeth there together. And when I first got there, uh, he said, whenever anyone tells you to uh, ask you to do something, 
Even if you don't know how to do it, just say yes and then figure it out. And I thought that was, it was uh, scary, but I thought it was pretty good advice. And luckily there were enough guys that worked there, enough engineers, that I could always find someone who, had, who was 10 years older, who had lots more experience, and I could say, hey, I've got a, I've got a famous band coming in. Can you show me how to route, route the microphones through the SSL? And, and, uh, uh, and I'd get enough assistance to, to get through it. Um, so it's kind of being thrown out of the proverbial nest. But um, after, uh, after those three long years there, I started Gravity. I was, I was 24 years old, yeah. And I'd saved up, I'd sold my gear and saved up, sold my motorcycle and got, I had $13,000. So I rented this storefront in Wicker Park and uh, bought the best gear that was available at that time. And, it, and it, it was a real strategic time to be starting a studio for a couple reasons in 19, the summer of 94, 93. Um, Alesis ADATS had just came out, and this was a technology that used like uh, VHS cassettes to record eight tracks of digital audio. And uh, the, the, so the sound quality was, was better than uh, the, the reel-to-reel -reel machines that were at that semi-pro level, um, the Tascam and such. Um, and. Uh, so I started the studio, studio off with uh, a great deal of experience, um, uh, but pretty limited equipment. And um, the, you know, the, the first uh, see there for Veruca Salt was the first three days of the studio. Um, and then the, the just kind of went from there with the pumpkins and Verbo and Bob Mold and cupcakes and um, Basically, the timing was really good, and as I've told students, uh, uh, I, I, I used to say I, I was extremely lucky. But what I what I've learned is that luck is basically being prepared for opportunity. So I was really well prepared to start a studio, and so when these these talented artists found found me, I was able to convert. You know, I was able to do a. Uh, it wasn't unusual for me to work extra hard and late and et cetera in order to get it right. So that was uh, the beginning of Gravity. And what, uh, as, uh, as the uh, cash became a little better, um, I, uh, rather than sticking with the latest and greatest, so to speak, from a technological standpoint, I did something that was somewhat uh, unusual at that particular time. It became normal later. But I went to vintage gear. Um, uh, so I, start, I got a Studer reel-to-reel -reel tape machine. Um, oh, a picture of that up there. Yeah. And um, you know, this thing weighed, well, I don't know how many, 800 pounds or something. It was unbelievably heavy. But um, sounded phenomenal. And. Uh, got a, a Neve 8058 uh, console from 1976, which we had for a decade. And uh, it, for the next 10 years, uh, the, the idea was uh, to uh, capture, this, uh, uh, capture the sound uh, utilizing second and third harmonic distortion, you know, getting um, those transformers and tape to um, cut off the harshness, uh, to saturate the, the, the drums and the guitars um, in such a way that they still had aggression, they still sounded um, powerful, but they didn't hurt your ears. I was, uh, I was keenly aware at that time of how my favorite records um, of, the, of that time and, and also in the, 80s as well, the uh, records that I thought sounded the best were uh, utilizing a, a lot of this, this technology with tubes and transformers, um, and that the, they weren't as harsh on the ear. So you could listen at a louder volume without um, having to turn it down and without having to back off. 
And that, that, that's that been uh, something I've been uh, keenly aware of ever since. Um, uh, at Gravity, just for those of you, I, I, I'm sure there's people in the audience of all different abilities and with have, who have an appreciation and understanding of the process, but for those of you who, who aren't as familiar, basically, um, the process of recording out, uh, music is uh, uh, in the genre that I was working and, and still do, is uh, tracking is the first step, and then overdubs, uh, mixing, and mastering. So those are kind of the four creative steps. So um, tracking inv involving the drummer. Basically, if uh, what we what we have traditionally done at Gravity is ask the band to play together, um, in order to get a certain feel and to make sure that the tempo is just right for the vocals, um, and to uh, if there's adjustments that I feel were necessary um, to the songs, um, it it was I was happy to have the whole band there so that I could run it by everyone because. Uh, it, there's going to be one shot, you know, at getting this right, or else we'd have to set the drums up next week, et cetera. So uh, tracking, uh, sometimes we would end up keeping the other instruments that we recorded, and sometimes we'd um, just use the drums, uh, edit the drums, perhaps, on, which was in those days pretty crazy with two-inch tape and, and uh, uh, you know, with the... Just the whole process was, was laborious compared to the way things are now. Um, mixing is one of my favorite parts of the process. Um, yeah. Thanks. So, um, mixing basically is that process of, of um, uh, getting the instruments on individual channels, balancing them and uh, balancing their tone uh, so that you can uh, record them onto a stereo uh, stereo uh, track. Uh, and mastering uh, is the final process, and that's what I've spent a, a lot of time with. Um, so I'd be happy to talk in the future about mastering, but it's uh, uh, basically normalizing and massaging the tracks. And that's what I've spent my time with. So thanks for listening. Doug on the stage there. I'm certain that uh, you have some questions that you would like to ask of our panel uh, based on their fine presentations and their, their vast and broad experience. So uh, I think we have uh, the lovely and talented uh, Christopher Epic who will have a uh, microphone. If there's anyone who has a question, uh, raise your hand, and I'm sure they will. He will. Christopher will jump up, or you can shout one out. Yes, ma'am, you can shout out a question, please. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you from here. Would you be willing to repeat that? Um, how much do the pitches really change from room to room um, when you use the Ah, okay. Um, the, the question was about how much the pitches change from room to room. In other words, is that score going to look the same tomorrow? And no, they, they change enormously. Um, Though they'll also change in the same room between a rehearsal and the final performance. Acoustics is a weird art. Any, I, I don't know if there are any architectural acousticians here, but concert hall design, one of the big problems is that when the temperature changes and when people come in and out of the hall, it affects it. It's, it's a very high strung uh, system. It's like living with someone who drinks too much coffee. <laughs> so, so uh, no, it's, it's incredibly variable incredibly variable and um, the way the piece works in fact is that at the end of a run like that you end up with a file so that you can leave it behind in the concert hall a, a printout of the thing as, as, as traditional music so that they have a, a sort of a portrait of the space and in every space it's different.
Great. How about another question here? Any other uh, curious about the instrument, the the guitar or Gravity Records, mixing, mastering, engineering, cool musical stuff? Yes, sir. I think it's sir. Yes. Torin. You mean like smart instruments? Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. Incident Technologies was the company that came out with the GTAR. And um, they're now under another name called OFO. And they just launched a new product called Keys, which is basically a keyboard that is just a little tiny rectangle with buttons on it in the pattern of a keyboard. And they're all RGB LED uh, lightable as well as iPhone dockable, and it all connects magnetically. So there's no wires or anything like that, and you can relay the information back to your computer via just the, the out on your phone. So it's this really nifty little device that you have um, that you can basically take anywhere, put in your pocket, put in a little gig bag, and you can do the, the exact same things basically that you can do on the GTAR just under the setting of a keyboard. How about another question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, but then you have to scan all those hundreds of thousands of pages. Uh, it's a slow process. That, that it is happening more and more and more that that people are going over to to using iPads for music display, and there's some very clever foot switch systems. So you no longer need that person hovering over you on the right side of the piano to turn the pages. But it is it's it's like saying why can't we get all our books on on Google Books? In other words, it's it takes a while to get it all over, and there are licensing issues, of course, as well. I think, uh, I think the, oh, sorry, we had the, oh, I'm sorry, Doug, you would join add. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, additionally, I think uh, the, si the iPad is are relatively small compared with a, a couple pages of music, so sometimes it's a visual thing. Um, Oh, Large right. print. Yeah. <laughs> the there's a, there, there's also version. a thing which is that for every beautiful score you see, yeah. there's 24 versions that are scribbled in pencil and are written over. Uh -huh. I mean, anyone who's done sessions with horn players knows that you know you're you're rewriting the chart in the middle of the session, and that's much easier to do on paper and pencil than it is on a computer. I think we have one final question here from our exceedingly lovely, charming woman in the front row. <laughs> Yeah, in in the world of engineering, uh, ears are extremely important. Uh, there are software uh, programs and plugins that have uh, been devised that purport to, um, you know, mix and master music. Um, I don't. Uh, boy, to, for me, the idea is so unappealing that yeah. that I haven't even considered it. But I know there probably are. Thousands of people that are interested in it, so uh, we'll see what happens. Well, you know, they've said that year after year about yeah, lots I mean, of uh, things. Uh, you know? I think um, if if you look at what's happened with facial recognition software, I mean, even e even you just put snap snapshots into your iPhoto, and it's already trying to figure out who they are. So, I mean, there are obviously people working on this. It's just a question of how good they'll get. I think they'll very soon get as good as a mediocre engineer. 
Well, I think that is about what we have time for. But our guests, are, our panelists, are still going to be hanging around here after for a little bit afterwards. Uh, we want to encourage you all to uh, visit c2st.org to learn more about the fabulous programming we have coming up next month. And on June 4th is our fabulous uh, fund gala fundraising event down at the Adler Planetarium. How about one more hand for our great panel? Our great panelists, they're still hanging around here. Thank you all very much for coming out. <laughs>